But our next presentation is going to come to us from Fiji. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Donald Wilson. Dr. Wil Dr. Wilson is the Associate Dean Research at the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences of the Fiji National University, and they have a live audience in Suva. Over to you, Donald. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Willa Vinaka from Suva, Fiji, uh, at the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences. We are fortunate to have this uh, partnership with the Otago Global Health Institute, uh, and we're very happy that we can join this webinar series. And we're also very happy uh, that uh, today Fiji is able to present uh, its status as far as COVID-19 is concerned. And we're also very happy this morning uh, that we have uh, one of the very key people on the uh, incident management team of, uh, of the uh, COVID-19 response for Fiji, uh, and her name is on the program. So without further ado, I'll invite Dr. Alicia Sahu Khan, uh, who is the acting head of health protection at the Fiji CDC uh, to take us and tell us the story about how Fiji handled COVID-19. Dr. Alicia, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Wilson, and thank you to everybody here at the Pacifica Auditorium at Fiji National University, and also to the Otago uh, Global Health Institute for the invitation to tell um, a bit of Fiji's story uh, and our experience with uh, COVID-19. Um, so I'm Dr. Alicia Sahu Khan. I'm the Acting Head of Pro Health Protection with the Ministry of Health and Medical Services uh, here in Fiji. I'm one of over 6,000 healthcare workers in Fiji who have been working extremely hard um, to tackle this outbreak. And I'm also part of the leadership um, team at the Ministry of Health and Medical Services. So the title of my talk is, How Did Fiji Beat COVID-19? So this is a very out there and ambitious um, topic for sure. Uh, we don't actually like to say that we've beat it because as long as COVID-19 exists in the world, it's a threat to Fiji. So we like to say, that we have it contained. How did Fiji contain COVID-19? So just a quick background, if you're not familiar with Fiji, our population during our last census in 2017 was 884,887. We're a group of islands of over 330 islands in the South Pacific. Um, so far with COVID-19, we've had 18 confirmed cases. Our first case was on, um, detected on March the 19th, and our last case was detected on March the 18th. We've had no deaths to date, thankfully, or intensive care unit admissions. And according to the WHO, our transmission classification is sporadic cases. So this is just one level below, below what, no cases. So these are countries with one or more cases that are imported or locally detected. Just to note that all of our 18 cases have either been um, directly re related to travel, so people who have traveled overseas, notably um, all of our travel related cases have come from Australia, uh, New Zealand or the United States, or there have been close contacts of these travel related cases, and in one case it was a close contact of a close contact of a travel related case. So just an outline of my talk today, um, I will be talking about uh, Fiji's response and delving a little bit into our preparedness and response plan, and then go through a timeline of key events that shape the, um, the response to the outbreak. Then a little bit into the public health interventions, including the non-pharmaceutical interventions that were key to containing the outbreak, a brief epidemiological overview, and then a question about lab testing. Is Fiji testing enough? Because this is a, is this a question that frequently, frequently comes up in the public and in, um, in the media. Um, then we'll go into key components of effective response in Fiji. And then where to ne next? What do we do now? First, looking at our preparedness and response plan. So there are seven key components of this plan. And 
I won't go um, in depth into every single component. I will be highlighted in specific parts of the talk. But by far, we found that the most important component was command and coordination. Establishing a command structure very early and being able to coordinate not within, just within Ministry of Health and Medical Services, but across to, to an all of government response. And we're very fortunate in Fiji that we had a very, um, our leadership right to the top levels of government, our Honorable Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama, really took great interest in the response to COVID-19 and particularly um, was very receptive to the leadership of the Ministry of Health in um, directing that response. We we're very uh, fortunate in that regard. Of course, um, the uh, surveillance, risk assessment and response was a key part of the action plan. Laboratory services, um, clinical case management, infection prevention control, public health interventions, risk communication and logistics procurement and supply management were all key, key parts of the response and our framework for action. Within our response plan, we really structured our response based on two strategies for responding to this outbreak. One was containment, and this is based on scenarios um, based on how many cases we we're having, and then moving to mitigation. We're thankful that we never had to move beyond containment. So within contain the containment, our scenarios included our first cases, and then having small clusters of cases. And, and the uh, strategies to deal with this were the strategies that I'll be um, detailing after this. Um, but then also that we had the third scenario of multiple clusters, which we haven't gotten to yet, thankfully. But this is important because moving from containment to mitigation, if some, some of you would have remembered right in the beginning of the outbreak, um, worldwide, the pandemic, it was recognized that once you break containment, really, your resources become stretched to the point where mitigation is the only option. So we were determined right at the get-go from our first case that we would not, we would try very hard not to go beyond containment. Understandably, we're a low middle income country, we're a small island developing states. We've, state, we've all heard of the very famous uh, concept of flattening the curve. Well, why, why, why are we trying to flatten the curve? We're trying to get below the threshold of what our health system can deal with, our health system capacity. And we know in low uh, LMICs, that threshold is much lower than in high income countries. So we had a, a much um, higher, I think, uh, level of um, response in terms of action once we got our first case. And I will be, talk about this a bit more later, when we had our first case, that was our trigger for very rapid and stringent action. And this is uh, in contrast to a lot of other countries in the world who had a bit, a, a bit of a higher tolerance. They may have gone beyond 100 cases, beyond 1,000 cases before they did really put in a lot of um, measures, public health measures that were actually quite disruptive um, to the societies as a whole. So this is um, just a quick timeline of some of our key events, just to show you, about, tell you how early we acted. So our National Health COVID-19 Task Force was formed um, at the end of January. And we're very glad that we formed this task force because it was a very much a multi-sectoral uh, task force. It included the Ministry of Health, academia, including of course, Donald Wilson from uh, Fiji National University, um, the private sector, and development partners, um, including um, um, the SBC. So this task force was still is in existence and it is very much a brains trust that um, advises on policy, health related policy advice uh, for the, um, the outbreak. And on the 24th of January, there was a multi-agency steering committee that was um, interministerial, shared by the permanent secretary uh, for health and medical services. And this reported directly to um, the uh, Fiji government's cabinet. On the 2nd of March, an incident management team was established. Now this team was key because it essentially um, was used to really focus resources within the ministry on COVID-19 while being able to maintain normative functions within the Ministry of Health. So our current, uh, our recent acting permanent secretary um, of health and medical services, Dr. James Fong, was 
was the general manager of the insulin management team until this week. Um, and it was really, we found that it was really important to implement that structure that was, was also um, advised by WHO because it would really help with the coordination between ministries. It did not just include Ministry of Health staff, it also includes um, secondees from different um, uh, ministerial portfolios. In February to March, to March, before we had our first case, we were very busy preparing. That is just a, just a handful of the guidelines that we put together. And there was, of course, corresponding training that went with, along with it. One of the key trainings that we had in early February was the um, uh, training for the public health and primary care response to COVID-19. So this is, oh, this is in early February, well over a month before our first case. So we were very aware that preparedness was key to responding because we did expect to get cases. On the 24th of, um, this, this timeline looks a bit more at our border measures. We found that border control, shutting our borders, of course, was something that really did um, help in the containment of this disease in Fiji. So from the 24th of um, January, there were travel advisories um, uh, issued to Fijians advising first against um, travel to the Hubei province. This later expanded to include all of mainland China. By the 28th of January, we began symptom screening of passengers um, arriving at our international airports. And we imp uh, implemented a supplementary health arrivals card on the 2nd of February. By the 2nd of February, we had prohibited um, foreigners entering Fiji uh, who had been in mainland, mainland China within the last 14 days. This, exp this restriction expanded to Italy, Iran, South Korea, Spain, USA, and the United Kingdom as the pandemic progressed across to these countries. Any Fijians returning from these countries were required to home quarantine for 14 days. By the 16th of March, we had banned all cruise ships from entering Fijian waters. By the 26th of March, this is after our first case was confirmed on the 19th of March, all international air and seaports were shut down and border, the borders were closed to foreign um, travelers. We still kept um, accepting, of course, our Fijian citizens coming back into the country um, and yachts were banned by the 30th of March. By the 28th of March, um, we had compulsory quarantine at government designated quarantine facilities, and this was mainly rep repatriated um, Fijian citizens. Right from the beginning, this was managed by the Republic of Fiji military forces. And by mid-April, we had mandated testing at after day 14 of quarantine for all of our repatriated citizens in the quarantine facilities. Um, looking at budget and legislation, so we uh, were given a res COVID-19 response budget um, by the Fijian government of 14 million in addition to the current Ministry of Health budget. On the 29th of January, of course, we declared um, novel coronavirus, 2019 NCOV, as it was called at the time, as a national notifiable disease. And we did amendments to the Public Health Act to make um, certain uh, violations enforceable as well as increase penalties, which were quite uh, archaic um, based on the previous legislation. Um, these are some key achievements in health system strengthening that was part of our COVID uh, preparedness and response plan. Lab testing began in Fiji on March the 11th at the Fiji CDC. This is our only molecular um, testing lab and the, we use, of course, the uh, real-time RT-PCR. And then recently we had, uh, we've started gene expert testing both, which are molecular methods. And it remains the only testing facility for COVID-19 in Fiji. There was also identification of hospital and community isolation facilities for COVID-19. And there was more than 200 beds prepared for an influx of cases of COVID-19 with the intent to have 50 isolation beds in each division at any one time. We're thankful that we did, to date, we have not uh, had to utilize uh, most of that capacity. We also upgraded our intensive care unit with the necessary, necessary equipment uh, for managing severe cases of COVID-19, including ventilators and recently the AVO machines that were donated by the New Zealand government. Looking at public health interventions, it's 
not much different to what we know we should be doing, what other countries have done successfully worldwide. Key to our response was early detection, testing, isolation of cases, tracing of their contacts and quarantine. This is the same thing that has been done in many countries that have successfully contained COVID-19. We also implemented lockdowns, but our lockdowns were uh, specific to geographical areas. So when we uh, were based on an assessment of the risk of uh, spread of those cases. So when we got our first case in Lotoka, it was decided um, our second city to lock down Lotoka city for at least um, one incubation period to allow our contact tracing teams to find all contacts and to assess whether there was any community transmission. Um, into, and of course, in those lockdown areas, everything but essential services were running. For the rest of the country, there was, um, uh, our essential services continued, most businesses did continue, although at times there were, there were slowdown of businesses just to try and commute, um, reduce that community transmission. And of course, social distancing and hygiene measures were emphasized to the public. Just some key statistics when it comes to our contact tracing and quarantine. So by the 11th of May, there were more than 4,000 direct and casual contacts of, of our 18 cases that had been followed up and assessed. Also, we um, had screened over 96% of our population through our mobile fever clinics or our fee fixed fever clinics. So the intent of these fever clinic clinics was actually to find people who meet our case definition for COVID-19 and test them if they do meet our case definition. What we found in some of the lockdown areas is that when we set up fixed cl uh, fever clinics, we weren't getting the numbers that we did, we would have expected for people visiting the clinics with symptoms. So this was really uh, reaching out, going out into the community to find more cases, active um, uh, case detection. So if anybody met our case definition at the time, which was uh, at that time was um, travel history with COVID symptoms or contact with a case with COVID symptoms, they would be um, swab tested for COVID-19. Of course, uh, the vast majority of the people in this group were not, were not actually uh, tested. It was a purely a screening program. We've had approximately close to 3,000 international arrivals, which are mostly repatriated citizens who have been quarantined in government uh, designated facilities um, as, as of the 29th of May. So just looking at a brief epidemiological summary of our cases to date. So we have had 18 cases, all have recovered, we've had no deaths. It's now, as of today, it's been 67 days since our last case and 97 days since our first case. Um, that is our epi curve, of course, and you'll see that uh, peak followed by sharp decrease and then a breakdown by uh, division. If you look at the age group dis distribution, you'll notice that most of our cases were in, in the younger age group, um, in the 20 to 29. But of course, because we had so few cases, it's difficult to extrapolate anything from this data. 11 of our cases were female and seven were male. All of this information is available on the Fiji government's uh, website. I would like to, bring up this topic a bit because um, quite frequently in a low middle income country when it's reported that we have so few cases and no deaths quite often the uninformed view is oh you must not be testing enough so first, so i'm going to go through a few different questions or topics first of all how much is enough believe me i've looked I've looked through all the guidelines, all the protocols that are available through WHO and other agencies. There is no number for what is enough. And a famous epidemiological answer to questions like that is, well, it depends. And well, it depends on what? Well, it depends on the size of your outbreak. It depends on your level of transmission. So the country with the most number of tests right now is the United States. They've tested over 20 million people. But does that mean that taking that metric alone, does that mean that they have good control? We know by looking at other metrics that no, that's not true. So I'll be talking a little bit about that, um, delving into how much we're testing, other metrics for testing, including test per population, test positivity, test per confirmed case, how frequently we're testing and who we're testing. So this is just a breakdown of our, 
of our testing to date. Well, actually, of um, this, this, this is a bit, this is a week old data. So as of June the 14th, we have done over 4,000 tests. Our test per population is uh, 4.7. Today, we've, as of today, we've done about 4,500 tests and it's over five per 1,000 population. We're doing, we were doing about 100 tests a day um, about a week ago and about 500, over 500 tests a week. Our test positivity has been at 0.4%, of course, because we haven't had case in over 60 days. And we're doing about 225 tests per confirmed case. So these are some key metrics. Um, if you want to look at how much we're testing compared to other countries, so this is uh, courtesy of our world in data and I've just added in Fiji's information. So Fiji is in this category down here. So the below 10 per thousand um, tests. So you'll see some countries are doing an, uh, a, a large number of tests up to 60 and 70 per thousand. And Australia and New Zealand are in that category of testing. Something else you'll notice is that the countries that are doing this level of testing are high income countries. So that leads us to the question, is it only high income countries that have successfully contained or flattened this outbreak or flattened the curve? And have all high income countries been successful? And we know that's not true. So just narrowing down to these countries who have done less than 10 uh, tests per thousand population. And this is the category that Fiji is in. And you'll see some of the countries that are in this category that are quite surprising. Japan is there, Taiwan is there. We know that Taiwan in particular has, done, has been very success, successful in containing their outbreak. Uh, Vietnam is also there. They're another low middle income country that has been very successful in containing their outbreak. So obviously, just looking at tests, number of tests and test per population is not a good measure of whether you have contained your outbreak or how good your control is. So what else can you use? So first of all, um, I, I love this quote by an economist, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to, be, ceases to be a good measure. If you're just gonna rely on test, number of tests, you really, you will not be doing a good job in seeing how well a country is containing the outbreak. So this is directly uh, taken from the John Hopkins uh, University Coronavirus Resource Center site. Um, and they've said that testing programs should be scaled to the size of the epidemic, not the size of their population. And looking at the positivity rate is the most reliable way to determine if a, test, if a government is testing enough. But again, we go back to that quote. If the measure, if the measure becomes the target, it no longer is a good measure. So, you, so basically what I'm trying to say is you need to look at a few different metrics before you can make a judgment um, on how well a country is doing in terms of containing an outbreak and whether they're testing enough. So if you look at our positivity rate, this is Fiji as of 15th of June, we're at 0.4%. And this is the same as Australia or New Zealand, who of course are doing much more tests than we are. Right at the bottom of the graph, you see Brazil on the 29th of May their positivity rate was at about 90%. And we know that they're having a terrible time uh, in that country. Another measure, of course, is total number of tests per confirmed case. And this is literally the inverse of the positivity rate. So trying to see how many um, tests you are doing in order to confirm one case of um, COVID-19. Again, Fiji is at 225, so just behind Australia and New Zealand and above um, Taiwan at 165. And again, Brazil is right at the bottom of um, that graph. So what these measures, test uh, positivity and test per confirmed case, could indicate is that you are testing widely enough to be picking up not just the people that are most likely to have COVID-19, but also those who are less likely to have COVID-19. So if you're getting a test positivity of 50%, it's likely you're just testing those most likely. So in places like New York City, for example, at the height of their outbreak, their test positivity was between 50 to 70%. Once they increased testing and expanded it beyond just hospitalizations, that of course decreased. So what that indicates is that your final number of your total cases that you pick up is more likely closer to the true number than if you are testing less. But that's not enough. 
as well as looking at, test, at your total number of tests or test per population and your test positivity and test per confirmed case, how frequently are you testing? Because you can just test a large number of people at one point in the outbreak and you get great test positivity, but if you're not testing regularly, how are you monitoring your outbreak? So this is looking at Fiji's uh, test per day since June, uh, as of June the 14th, and you can see that we've been testing daily. Um, and our tests have actually increased, our test numbers have actually increased since our last case, which, case, which was on 19th of April. So we've actually increased the testing, even though we've had no cases reported. And this is just looking at the test per week. And then of course, as well as how frequently you're testing, who are you testing? Because with test positivity, if you really wanted to, um, I guess, game the system, you could just target a group of people who you pretty sure don't have COVID-19 and that will lower your test positivity. So we, you need to know who a country is testing. So first, who, who does WHO say we should test? So WHO bases their advice on um, who should be tested on the level of transmission. So no cases versus sporadic cases, versus community, community transmission. So WHO recommends that all suspected cases should be tested for COVID-19 according, according to the WHO case definitions, which I will um, briefly describe later. If you have surges in influenza-like illness, you, that should, should be investigated. All contacts of cases should be investigated and tested. Um, and it's a similar for sporadic cases um, as well. Uh, there's not much difference between the uh, testing between report um, countries with no cases versus sporadic cases, except there's an emphasis on investigation of those cases and the testing of contacts. And then with clusters of cases um, and community transmission, of course, they recommend that you upscale testing because of course you'll have more suspected cases in those scenarios. And looking, this, this is the case definition for suspected um, cases from the WHO. So basically, it's anybody with an acute respiratory illness with a history of travel to a place that has community transmission, anybody who has had contact with a case, and anybody with a severe acute respiratory illness and an al absence of an alternative uh, diagnosis and admitted to hospital. So what is Fiji doing? Who are we testing? We're following the WHO criteria for our suspected cases. We've got two, uh, two criteria, criteria for testing. One is category rule one, suspected cases, which is the WHO criteria, but expanded. So that is anyone with international travel and history of, uh, illness, of uh, severe acute, um, of acute respiratory illness, anyone who's been a contact, a healthcare worker who's um, been caring for cases and is, uh, has now got symptoms. And then expanded even further. So asymptomatic close contacts of COVID cases, asymptomatic healthcare workers who've completed 14 days quarantine after caring for a COVID-19 case. And then we've got a second category, well beyond the WHO um, testing recommendations for sentinel surveillance. In Fiji, any adult patient admitted to hospital for an acute respiratory illness is tested for COVID-19. We've also identified high risk groups so that so if anybody in this group who has an acute respiratory illness should be tested for COVID-19. So that's healthcare workers, institutional residents, including um, in our corrections facilities. And then in the general population, we're taking random samples from sentinel sites across Fiji um, for people presenting with acute respiratory illness, just to see if there's any ongoing any community transmission. So that's an overview of who we're testing, how often we're testing, how much we're testing, and how we compare to other countries who have also contained or very um, close to containing COVID-19. Some other surveillance that we do, of course, we watch our influenza-like illness trends. We've got 68 sites across the country and our trend has been downward and we are now at the end of our flu season. Um, severe acute respiratory infections, of course, anybody admitted to an ICU with a severe, severe acute respiratory infection has been tested. And then we are monitoring our hospitalizations for acute respiratory illness, which have also been um, at our normal levels. So that's my spiel on testing. Um, I'll just 
talk a little bit about what we have noticed about what are really key components of an effective response. Again, we're a low middle income country. We're very restrained in our resources. But what we have noticed a similarity between us and other comparable countries is early and rapid response. We acted before our first case. We were preparing well before our first case, but we responded decisively and swiftly with our first case. We did not wait to, uh, to build up to 100 cases or more. We responded with our first case. Leadership is key. Having an overall leadership, a government that listens to science, listens to the advice of medical advisors is key. And it also um, reinforce the, the buy-in of other agencies. So if you had the Honorable Prime Minister, of course, leading our press conferences and pushing the response, you had a lot of buy-in and a lot of cooperation um, to respond decisively. And of course, the all of government response and coordination, which is very key and evident in our incident management team. And then not a, last but not least, with the development partner assistance. We have a great relationship with the World Health Organization and development partners, including the Australian and New Zealand governments, um, the Pacific um, community and other uh, governments and agencies that have been helping throughout this response, particularly in issues such as procurement of lab uh, testing consumables. Now, my last slide is a very short and simple slide. It's where to next, living in a post-COVID-19 world. And I don't have much, any detail on this slide because really it is, it's an open question. There is no blueprint, there's no guideline from where we go from here. As a COVID-19 contained country, we're existing. Uh, we've done very well. We're in a position that a lot of countries would envy, but where to next? How do we do more than exist in a post-COVID-19 world? How do we live? And that's something that we're grappling with right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Alicia. Um, Jackie, I know that we are three minutes after one, uh, and I know that we had uh, agreed that we do five minutes of answer, uh, questions from here, and then the rest you can take on the questions that are scre streaming through on your side. Uh, how would you want to do this? And Donald, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think just go ahead with your live questions. And we have had a few questions come in on the Q&A here, um, but we won't do those. We will just uh, put those in writing for, for our speakers. So go ahead with your live session, Donald. All right, thank you. So thank does you. anyone have any questions from this room? Yes, Tim. Uh, hi, Dr. Alicia and uh, everyone who's listening up. Uh, this is Taina. I uh, teach at the medical school in the Suva. Uh, I'd like to comment the testing and the work done by the Ministry of Health and the uh, Fiji CDC. Um, we've noticed that uh, the cases that we uh, had were not severe cases and uh, introductions from four different uh, countries. So my question is, um, is there plans or have you uh, sent our samples for sequencing to determine the strain that uh, we have, or we have imported from these uh, four different countries? Thank you. Thank you, Taina. And Taina is a former member of Fiji CDC, so we're very glad to have that question. Um, so as part of the WHO um, 
part of the assessment of us as a testing lab for COVID-19 was for us to send uh, our first few COVID-19 positive case samples to the um, WHO Collaborating Centre Reference Lab in Melbourne, Australia, which is the um, Vidral, which is part of the Peter Doughty um, Institute. So we did uh, send a few of our first um, samples. They have those samples. And more recently, we've sent all of our samples um, to be sequenced. Yes. No. Yes, so, so the question was about um, genetic sequencing of our 18 confirmed uh, case samples. And the answer, of course, was that yes, we've sent them and we're waiting for results. Sorry, uh, Jackie, we've, uh, would you want to go ahead with the questions that are streaming? I see that there are several on the, that are getting texted through. Um, Donald, I think what we may need to do is actually um, is go through your, your questions, but perhaps um, for people who need to leave the webinar, just so they are assured that those questions will be in writing. But uh, you have a live audience, so I think let's prioritize that, Donald. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alicia, thank you. Uh, I think just leading on from Taina's question is uh, the 18 cases that we've had uh, and the duration of positivity, uh, how do we explain the differences and quite different among some about the duration of positivity of the cases? Okay, so our previous um, discharge from isolation criteria was that a person needed uh, to have two negative uh, COVID-19 um, COVID uh, tests uh, within um, at least 24 hours uh, of each test before we would release them from isolation. And of course, um, all, all of our cases were isolated in hospital. So they were all hospitalized. What we found was that uh, we had a number of cases that had a very long duration of testing positive by RT-PCR. Our, our longest, I think, was over 70 days. Um, of course, they were completely asymptomatic by this time, and we really were being very cautious. We were using more the Asian guidelines of um, when you should uh, release someone back into the community. Since then, of course, there's been a lot more evidence that a positive PCR after recovery, after resolution of symptoms, is likely just remnants of the virus, not, not live virus, it's dead virus. Um, so we did a, a review of all of the evidence, looked at the guidelines by different countries, including Australia and New Zealand, latest WHO guidelines that have come out just in the last few weeks, saying very clearly that um, after about 10 days of illness, if a person is asympto completely asymptomatic, they should not be considered as infectious. So we have since revised our um, release from isolation uh, criteria, but yes, there, was, there are a number of um, our cases that had a very long period of where they were still testing positive by, by RT-PCR. Again, acknowledging that that is not a measure of whether they were infectious or not, or if they were still infected. They were just having remnants of the virus still detectable. Yeah, we're very sorry about the mic situation here. Does anyone else have another question? Uh, Jackie, I think we'll, we'll hand over to you. I think Jackie has said that those, all of those, I can see that there are 10 questions uh, that will be emailed to you. Uh, Jackie, I think uh, for the in, in the interest of time, uh, we just before we hand over to you, would like to also acknowledge uh, the Acting Permanent Secretary of Health and the Chief Medical Advisor who we just walked in. But um, thank you, Dr. Alicia. And do you have any questions for Alicia from your side, Jackie? Hi there, Donald. We have a few questions, um, but I do think because we are out of time and people do have tight schedules, I would rather just put those uh, to her in writing um, so as not to take up too much of anyone else's time. You can feel free to continue with your Q&A session in Suva though. 
um, but I do need to actually bring our webinar to a close. Thank you so much for your participation, our Fiji colleagues, and also to Dr. Das from the School of Pharmacy. Um, we will be back again for the next uh, instalment in the COVID-19 masterclass tomorrow from 12 to 1. Yamihi. Thank you.